All right, well, we have a very special episode here of D&D Dad and Son. Uh, first of all, uh, first time ever uh, that we're on camera, but the only reason we're doing that is because we have a very special guest today, Greg Gillespie, who uh, probably doesn't need much introduction from people who would watch this type of show. He's very well known in the D&D circles uh, for his uh excellent products uh some of those include well his flagship product uh barrel Mace, which is uh, an excellent very well regarded mega dungeon kind of a gold standard in the industry um he followed that up with uh, the forbidden caverns of archaea as well uh, another um excellent uh entry into the world of mega dungeons I don't have my High Fell M3, but that is coming in print along with the new product, which we'll get to. Uh, also, next in the fourth in the series, Greg, you had Dwar Deep about the dwarves, which is, you know, fantastic book. And then, of course, there's the Mega Dungeon Monster Manual. This is a wonderful resource. Really awesome throwback. Old school. Um, uh, monster mm -hmm. manuals and just the the right look and feel. Um, welcome, Greg. Oh, so glad to have you. Ah, thanks for inviting me. There might be a little bit of an echo on, on Josh's mic. Uh, yeah, just from what I'm hearing. So Josh might might need to be aware of that. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'm uh, excited to talk uh, D and D with my uh, my favorite subject. Yeah, awesome. Well. Yeah, I mean that it's it's so great to have you, and you know here we are at like the fiftieth anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons, so it's not just any old time. You know that we're we're sitting at the fiftieth anniversary. Of course, the buzz right now is that Watsy's come out with this fiftieth uh, anniversary, um, I guess, reprint of the original D and D, and and they've done their best to, uh, you know. Um, make it sound like it was a terrible thing and you know the, the way that it was all done up back then is just not not good enough for our standards today but your product is not like that uh tell us about uh dragon slayer sure well just a quick word on <clears throat> that uh that book you had mentioned um you know it's it's like if you if you make a table and uh, you know, it's supposed to obviously have four legs, uh, but it only has three and you're kind of selling it. Well, you know, um, we, we, we could sell you a table with four legs, but we're only going to sell you one with three, which doesn't do anybody any good. It's, uh, kind of shooting yourself in the foot. It's not, it's what we've come to expect from Wizards of the Coast. They, they engage in this kind of self-loathing, um, when you should be celebrating the products that birthed your, birthed the hobby and that uh, people see as foundational text to the entire enterprise. Uh, so it's very difficult for me to see that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, we all know why it's being driven. They have a particular uh, ideological point of view from which they're coming. And, well, that's okay. But to me, Gygax and Arneson are two people to be celebrated. They're not people to be uh, dismissed. So asking about Dragon Slayer... Um, you know, my my books uh, celebrate um, the golden age of um, fantasy role playing, and uh, you know those were those were exciting times when we when we were playing those games and playing the different modules and adventures and and uh, reading supplements and you know at, at that particular point we were all pretty young and we we're all struggling reading high Gygaxian and. Uh, trying to <laughs> decipher it all and and see you know encompassing all these long words uh, that you wouldn't normally bump into, but but yeah. uh, that was an exercise in literacy. Of course, it was an exercise in math. It was an exercise in creativity and imagination. And it it's an it was a new paradigm. It's like a first play experience when when you encounter something for the first time that that's genuinely 
paradigm shifting or paradigm creating, then that resonates. And it's why, you know, here in 2024 on the 50th anniversary that we're celebrating this amazing game that meant so much to us when we were young that we taught it to our kids. And, um, and then we get to create family memories playing these games like you have with your son. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, it, we, we have a blast with it. Um, it, so it's, yeah, it's created just a whole legacy of fun, uh, for, you know, family and, and friends and things like that. Um, absolutely. Uh, yeah. When we, when we take a look at your Dragon Slayer product and actually I have it up on PDF, if you don't mind. You oh, no, absolutely. Bring it up if you like. Yeah, Awesome. Yeah. You um, can, uh, you can ask very pointed questions if you like, I'll do my best to answer them. Awesome. I mean, well, I mean, first of all, the artwork, right? That's fantastic. But I, what I wanted to say was, I mean, you open this up, it's reminiscent of those old days of gaming, you know, and that's something that a person's going to know right away. I mean, the product has that orange spine. Um, it's got the the fade from dark to light on the back cover, you know, everything and everything about it just feels like TSR era that we all knew and loved and that we all miss now, but uh, we're able to relive it uh, through, you know, Dragon Slayer and, you know, I, cause it's just a faithful homage. I feel like. Oh, um, cer certainly it is. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've maintained uh, all along, you know, I think there's been over the history of the hobby, there's been too many people trying to be the next Gary Gygax. And that's a mistake. Uh, it's a big mistake. Gary created a classic game, uh, like Monopoly is a classic classic game, like Scrabble is a classic game, and these um, these are these games are timeless. And to me, um, you know, TSR era D and D is cla a classic game. It doesn't need to be um, made and 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 remade. Um, you know, and I mean that from the standpoint that uh, of. Uh, of new editions. So, you know, Watsi's in the business of selling core books. So they have, to, they have to turn the game over every so often. Uh, but, but uh, I, I just feel like uh, Watsi, for example, they could be publishing um, material to support AD&D or second edition, and they probably make a killing on it if they did a good job and they, it was uh, devoid of, of ideology. Um, but, uh, but for, for whatever reason they've chosen not to do that now if i was in charge of watsi i would i would be i would definitely sub be supporting one or two of the um tsr editions and then i'd, I'd probably be supporting 3.5 uh, as well because there's still a lot of people that play that game yeah. so i think there are opportunities uh for there are wins across the board to be had mm -hmm. pardon me if all you do is put your ideology down for a moment and you say you know Who's playing what? And what do they value about that edition? And why do they want to keep playing it? And there are good reasons why we choose these older editions. They have a, they're, um, they're ha the uh, art matches the mechanics. Uh, the layout is simple because the game is simple as far as a fantasy role playing game is concerned. And, um, you know, you don't, it doesn't take a, like one of the things that really bugs me about, uh, aesthetic presentation, and you, you saw this quite a lot during the third edition era, was the core books would have like this, um, almost like a, a tan color, the pages as opposed to white. Then they would place black text on top of those tanned pages. And that's that's not good for for you know anybody that's visually impaired. And uh, and it's not clean either. And, the, and then in addition to that, they made the font even smaller. So... Oh. <laughs> like there were just there were losses like right across the board. So I just think that there are opportunities to keep things simple, to uh, keep in mind that your people are going to play your game that do have some um, that do have some uh, issues with their eyes. And, you know, let's not make let's not get the font uh, overly small and keep it clean. Right. Well, yeah. And I, I always kind of thought that, you know, TSR kind of had something going there with the two uh parallel uh product lines of like basic D D and A D and D, I, I thought. But you know, I think that Watsy, like if they wanted to go totally woke with fifth edition, 
you know, why not at least have like an alternative of like a non woke product line, you know, that where people who, you know, want to do the old thing could do that. Of course, they're not going to do that because of their ideologies and things like that. And of course, it'd be kind of a dubious thing to want to support a company that would indulge in the woke side of things anyway. But mm-hmm. um, speaking of like the old um, way that things were done with the basic D and D, and then we had a D and D. Dragon Slayer is a you know kind of a conglomeration of those things. Uh, why don't you tell us about how it's a mix of those? Sure. So <clears throat> when we played back in the day, um, as a lot of people did, you know, we had uh, the basic version or we had um, uh, Molde Basic in 1981. And, um, you know, I lived in a small town, so I didn't have access to everything immediately. So, you know, we we were accustomed to, to playing with the basic rules. And then when we when we got the AD and D books and we're trying to make sense, so you got the monster manual first, right? So we just incorporated the monster manual into the games we were playing, and then uh, the player's handbook, and then the DM guide. And we had a hard time as kids deciphering the DM guide. So we're like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense to us. So we're not doing it. Um, and then, so we we were really playing the the engine of BX, but with all the chrome of AD and D, because they, you know, the AD and D books are so full of flavor and they're so full of texture and imagination and creativity. How could a not, how could a young person not be captivated by them? And we certainly were. So at the end of the day, that's pretty much how we played through the first edition era. And it was really only with second edition through the 90s that I was playing using segments and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I really got on my nerves after years of of doing it. So I was like, yeah, I never really want to play with segments uh, ever again and weapon speed factors and things that, that, that made no sense. And quite honestly, they're bad rules and, uh, and they're bad rules because they weren't created to make the game more interesting. They were created to distinguish AD and D from, from basic so that artisan couldn't get paid royalties. Right. So now let's just hypothetically ask ourselves for a moment what if um Gygax and Arneson didn't have a falling out so if they didn't have a falling out and they were just marching along sharing royalties even if Arneson was in the background AD&D wouldn't have happened right so that means we would have had uh um you know Molde basic we would have had uh Metzner basic and what would have come after that? There definitely would have been another iteration. And it would have been, it would have added more details, right? Mm-hmm. Um, more crunch and things like that. So for me, as I think about Dragon Slayer, it's, if, if, it's like a counterfactual. If, if Arneson and Gygax stayed together, what would D&D have looked like by, you know... 80, 85, 84, 85, 86. And uh, it may very well have looked like Dragon Slayer. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the enticing thing about it because, you know, game-wise, I want to I wanna play BX. Like, it's, it's a great system. It's smooth. It's simple. I mm-hmm. don't like a lot of complications. Um, <clears throat> and, but, like, when you look through those monster manuals or, you know, just the just the various manuals of AD and D. Uh, it, it looks like there's so much in there that you you're missing out on that's just not in the basic. And so, you know, to get something that has both of those things together, which I think is what you've achieved here with Dragon Slayer, it really is the best of both worlds. Well, it has. It's those things. I, I, I'm hoping that it does that. I hope people feel that way. Uh, time will tell. Um, but, um, you know, we've, we've been playing, uh, at my table, you know, um, quite a long time with this rule set and, uh, and what we decided, we decided very early, which I think were fair criticisms that any, any fan of AD&D would, would acknowledge 
So, you know, illusionists sort of get hosed for magic users. Druids sort of get hosed for clerics. So, because, you know, the magic user was Gygax's pet cat. And, um, <laughs> and so th those were, th those were, th those were issues. Um, and there's some issues with uh, some of the demons and devils and, and, and so on and so forth. So those things needed to be uh, addressed. I felt like, now, could I, you know, take the AD and new books and, and play away and have great fun? Of course I could. But uh, there, are th there are just a little bit of unevenness that, that was, could be addressed. And that's what we tried to do. We also felt like the fighter really needed, um, like the fighter was the class that you played because... Uh, you couldn't qualify for anything else. And that's not a good reason to play a fighter. We wanted the fighter to have a unique ability that was exclusively his or hers that um, distinguished them at the table. And yes, I know the counter argument. Well, the fighters have access to all weapons. They have access to, by race, they have access to all armor. That makes them distinct and unique. Well, no, not really. Maybe it did when we were 10 or 11, but, but not now. And so what we've included is this mechanic called cleave. So you can see it there. If a fighter kills a target, she he immediately receives one additional attack per two levels. So, and this applies both to melee and missile attack forms. And what happens here is that, um, so if you can imagine a one hit die fighter, uh, or let's say a, a five hit die fighter fighting two hit die monstrous humanoids. The fighter can make fairly quick work. You know, if if the targets get softened a little bit, the fighter can go in there and start slaying multiple targets in a round. And that's actually, so if you think about it, that's something you want. So if you have you know a fifth level party fighting second or or third or two second or three hit two or three hit die monsters, you probably want that combat to go a little bit uh, faster. You don't want it to be sort of slow and bogged down. But then again, if a fifth level fighter is fighting a fifth level or uh, fifth hit five hit die monster, if I can get it out, then uh, then everything plays as it should, just as if the first level fighter is fighting a one hit die monster. So again, the onus is on the players to soften targets, then send the fighter in, because the fighter, because of the movement rules, can't move around a whole lot once they're engaged. So. Um, if, if you play to the rules, it's very efficient and, uh, I encourage, you know, we, we all house rule everything and I understand that, but, you know, if someone was considering, uh, playing Dragon Slayer, I would definitely, uh, you know, if you want with your group, have a, a few sample combats, you know, just, um, roll up, uh, first level characters or third level and then advance them to third, advance them to fifth and play monsters of equal hit die or, or, uh, lesser and and play it out and and you'll you'll find what what we found is it moves things along at the table it makes the fighter fun and exciting and it also distinguishes the fighter from the paladin and the ranger awesome yeah no that's 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 really cool because uh the fighter is kind of like uh you know your 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 standard character almost you know what i mean kind of like if you, mm -hmm. it's their fallback um but this kind of makes him you know gives him a specific uh ability that's really pretty pretty awesome it really kind of puts something into the mix that makes him unique and uh yeah no i like that and it's not um, like what, what we're talking so again i feel i come from the position of a great amount of um respect for gary gygax and dave arneson and I, I'm not trying to remake the game. I'm trying to tweak it uh, so it plays um, a little bit more efficiently because nobody wants, you know, hour or two long combats unless it's like a big, you know, boss thing. And even then it's not going to be that long. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just a little bit of flavor, I call it. Just a little bit of, you know, sprinkle in a little bit of flavor here and there. And yeah. uh, and it, it makes, and I know it's it seems easy to say in about four lines of text on a page but it's really profound when you play it in the game yeah yeah mm -hmm. no definitely i can totally see that so that's really and, great oh, just a, one other point to jump in there i apologize uh 
So, you know, everyone's familiar with the multiple attacks that would happen later on in AD&D for paladins and fighters and rangers and things. So paladins and rangers do get access to cleave, but it's in place of those multiple attacks at later levels. Right. So, so the paladin is great and they get all their, you know, priestly bonuses and things and protection from evil and lay on hands and all that stuff that distinguishes them. Uh, the the ranger is kind of like the the lone the wilderness loner you know the the lone wolf sort of thing and they can track and do the stuff that they do uh, so each is a little bit more distinguished in this way but they do get access to cleave at the same point in A D and D when they would get access to multiple attacks ah very cool yeah and you know we had talked a little bit about um, layout and things like that and making uh, making something obvious to readers. So you talked about how, you know, strategy wise, like you want uh, to tell people straight up, hey, use your missile attacks to soften targets, then send your fighters in, you know, just things like that, that, uh, you know, make sense. Um, you know, with the with those old manuals, at least when I look at them, they're, they're awesome. And I love them. But uh, there's so much in there that it's not incredibly obvious that those sorts of things would just have to come by you know um experience you know and and maybe a lot of bad experiences <laughs> and then you figure that out but uh, <laughs> but um i think a lot of this is like uh, kind of spelled out in your book for like the new players like hey here's a pro tip well Tell me about some of the I, I think we can all agree it doesn't matter what edition of DD you like best there are the written rules of role-playing, and then there are the unwritten rules of role-playing. And that's why, you know, so often if someone, you know, tries to jump in a game at a hobby shop or at a convention, if they're a first-timer, they have to kind of be mentored into it. And they need to be mentored into it because there are so many unwritten rules of role-playing. And they don't know that the um, hobby emerged in part from miniature wargaming. Right. And and so in that context, uh, communicating some of those unwritten rules in a kind of quick hit sage advice or whatever it may be, uh, I think was in, I, it had to be in there. And I just, um, you know, wanted it to be sort of in the appendices. It's pardon me. It's the kind of stuff that if you played with like your older brother, you know, they wouldn't want you to play at the big kids table, but you kind of like be listening and then when you did get to play you'd know what to do and it's yeah. like that so the big brother stuff is in the in the back of the book for the people that well okay i, I kind of get this game a little bit but you know how exactly do i try to succeed at it and and that's some of the sage advice you're talking about yeah no that's great i thought that was a really nice touch actually um you know as uh you know uh it's uh it's not a fifth edition game where you're you're gonna be basically guaranteed survivability, right? Like there's gonna be you, you got to watch yourself, got to play careful and play smart, mm -hmm. and uh, and so the, it makes sense that you'll you know you might want some tips in there, and uh, I think it, I, I appreciate it anyway. No, it's great. We we, we in our current game right now we're running uh, a basic expert and. Um, kids keep dying over and over <laughs> like my my seven-year-old it's like nothing to him now when his, uh, his character just dies it's like oh okay you know <laughs> yeah so <laughs> well we you know every now and again we get a character that's kind of a pet cat and uh we don't want to get the character killed but you know it's always interesting to me like people uh veteran role players of uh, early editions they um they're much less cautious um at, at first level like after they get a level or two under their belts like hitting like third maybe fourth they feel like okay i have to play even more cautious now because i've got months invested i'm actually casting decent spells now or whatever the case may be oh, yeah. and they become more cautious okay. around level yeah. four <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> is, i think it's always funny yeah <laughs> for sure you don't want all that to go to waste with from yeah. a silly decision and you can see, so, uh, like, I have their uh, attack bonus, and, um, you know, the players are, are mathematically, they're always basic, they're always at a combat disadvantage. 
So uh, in relation to monsters, so what they need to do, you like when I, I noted in the introduction that, uh, you know, read Sun Tzu's The Art of War right. um, from, you know, 2,500 years ago, because that's going to tell you pretty much how you should be playing an old school, an old school role playing game. Um, you know, you, you can, uh, if you have to get by the guard, the city guard, you know, lie, cheat, connive, do whatever you have to do to kind of get past the guard or get past yeah. the well, orc or whatever it is. And then, um, and then, uh, you know, because if you have to if you engage in direct combat, if I'm being the, the game master, I'm going to try to kill you because you've put dice in my hands. So, you know, players can tr control for the most part, with the exception of random monsters, when a game master rolls dice. And if, if you allow me to roll dice, I'm going to come at you. I'm going to come at you hard. It's not going to be pretty. And, um, and I'm going to try to kill you because the game doesn't have any meaning unless you, uh, there, unless there are risks uh, associated with it. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know that's, yeah, I know that that's, that's great. Like, um, well, let's switch gears here real quick. Um, I just, uh, so as far as like someone who's looking to trying to figure out like, should I get this game? Um, and they they might survey what else is available on the market. What what would you tell them is special about Dragon Slayer to you, or that you think they're going to get great value out of? Um, well, I would say you know one of the things that like for me, and I know if you've been you know around for a while, you've seen different editions come and go. Uh, modules come and go, things like that. And you know the difference between the ones that you immediately find inspiring and the ones that are just kind of dead on the page. Mm. Or there are big, huge gaps in layout. Or the art is not internally consistent or consistent with the mechanics. Or it's yep. strangely placed. Um, yep. Dragon Slayer... I did the layout, so if anybody really hates the layout, I'm I'm the you know, person you can blame <laughs> for that. And but if you, if you notice, every line of Dragon Slayer is accounted for on a page, uh, yeah. so and that makes it a ginormous pain in the butt when you're actually laying it out because if you change one line, then there's a cascade through the whole book. But if you do that and you have the thought and the care then as a result, you can you can see it. It's nice and tight. And yeah. that's the way a good-looking role-playing book should be. And quite honestly, if you've never laid out a, a role-playing game, because of the charts and the tables, and sometimes you get odd spaces, kind of like there at the bottom of uh, 104, uh, you know, you, you have to lay out the page. Then you send that page to the artist and say, okay, here's the space. This is what you have to work with. This is what I'd like to see. Um, do you have an alternative idea? And then you work through with the artist to get a very custom fit right into those spaces. And, you know, I think we we know of, of games that are out there and quite popular and, and uh, you know, I, the art's not consistent. Um, there are gaps in layout, things like that. There's, uh, there's nothing like that in Dragon Slayer. There's a lot, if anyone's familiar with Barrow Maze or with uh, some of the other adventures you spoke about when we opened, the same thought and the care is taken here. Is it perfect? No, uh, it's perfect for my for for my home game. Like we we we've been playing this for a long time, uh, so it's perfect for us. Um, and and I, I fully anticipate. You know, we we get, we veteran gamers. We love to house rule stuff, and and all. And I anticipate that that'll be done because that's how the hobby operates, and that's what we should be doing. Yeah, you know, like like you were talking about with the layout. Like I've seen examples of that all throughout the book. Right now, I just have the PDF copy. Like I mentioned, the print copy is coming in the mail, and I'm really looking forward to that. But yeah, look at so in this space here, this clearly relates to what's on the page, mm -hmm. you know. Which I, uh, which I'm assuming this is stinking cloud coming through, right? Because the guy's puking, and you know, stinking cloud or cloud. spore cloud, either will do. Yeah, either one. Yeah, because uh, but yeah, no, it's clearly associated with what's right there. Um, which is, you know, something that also you see in your Dwaro Deep product where you have the adventuring party at the bottom of the page and whatever's 
on the illustration. It's relevant to what's on the page. That's very, that's very useful. I, I really like that because you don't see that very much. And it must be about the way they lay out their, their um, pages and work with the, you know, artist submissions and things that they have. But I feel like you nailed it. And I guess for anyone watching this, I, I just want to, you know, give my endorsement. I mean, this is a high quality product. And it really does deliver on, you know, everything that you're looking for in an old school role playing game uh, in so many ways. And so I think, if, you know, uh, I, I don't I don't see anything else on the market that's like superior to this in any clear way. Like I, I look at this and this like this feels like what D&D &D should be. And it's it's just it's it's wonderful. Greg. It's lovely. Um, oh, I appreciate that very much. Like just to, because we're on that page, uh, if anybody um, isn't aware, so for a long time now, right from the outset, I've been I've always disliked uh, early D and D movement rules and movement rates, um, and I do I do very much like the uh, the three point five movement rules to allow miniatures to be used at the table. So when you look at spells here, for example, you're going to see things in feet. Um, and then with movement rate with armor and uh, and character race. So all that's in five, you can relate to five foot squares. So if you're using Dwarven Forge or terrain yep. of any type, that it'll all be applicable to miniatures. Now, you, that doesn't mean you have to use miniatures. You can do the same thing here and just do theater of the mind 100% uh, of the time. And, and it'll work because, quite, uh, to be very honest, you know, sometimes... I have the uh, time and to, to put forward some miniature stuff on the table. And then other times I'm just too busy and we just play theater of the mind and it's seamless back and forth. So if you enjoy minis, everything's coded here for you to use minis. And if you don't, you can theater of the mind and it'll work just great. Oh yeah, no, it's great. That That's really useful too. Um, because, you know, there's not any crazy conversion, uh, you know, with like, you know, how you want to use your minis. In fact, you even have a page here. I can't remember which page it is, Greg. It's near the back where it's like a... Uh, it's around the combat section. Yeah, okay, so it's a little bit up here. Mm -hmm. And it's like rules, uh, practical rules for with minis and stuff. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, here's combat. Just, just after this, you'll see some... Uh... Yeah, here it is. Perfect, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, I love this. This looks so awesome. You know, like it shows them on the grid just like just like it would in the game. And the artwork is so cool. I just love it. And then it's got the little arrows. This is wonderful. This is, And it's going to be so clear to read and, you know, understandable. And you know, I just love it. It's it's fantastic. Well, you know, That's most nice men and, and boys are, are visual learners. Uh, yeah. So, you know, when we see things like this, we're like, oh, okay, now I totally get it. You can write it out in text and make it crystal clear. But once you have the visuals along with the text, then I think then I think it uh, re the rules are reinforced. So that's what I wanted to do here. Not go overboard. These are what, I, what, what we've called miniature light rules. Uh, so, you know, these are the... Um, the, the rules that, that make sense for old school D&D, &D, but do not bog down combat. Yeah. No, yeah, no, this is this is great. It's awesome. Um well, um let's talk about some of the art because like the first thing that hits you when you take a look at this is this gorgeous uh Jeff Easley cover that we have here. I'm going to actually make this bigger just cuz it's so awesome. Uh, right. So tell us the story behind this. Uh you know, how did you like reach out to Jeff and did he give you, did you talk about what you wanted on here? Did he give you various uh, submissions and you picked one or what, what happened? Well, so Jeff uh, normally, uh, well, going back quite a few years now, he was uh, routinely at uh, North Texas RPG Con and he'd be at his booth painting something right there. Uh, and which is pretty awesome. So I just, I'd watch and then, you know, eventually introduce myself and said hello. And then the next year, the same kind of thing. And, and then, um, I started asking him if he'd be interested in doing a cover 
and, uh, you know, sent a gentle reminder once every month or once every couple months. And, you know, he's busy and doing his thing and whatever. And I didn't really hear from him for a long time. And uh, then just gently sent a reminder. And I guess I caught him on the right day. And and he agreed to, to, to do it. I definitely wanted to work with him. I've been very fortunate to work with uh, uh, Larry Elmore and Darlene and um, Errol Otis and uh, uh, Jim Holloway. Uh, Russ Nicholson. So I, I really definitely wanted to work with with Jeff. And we came down, what I wanted was the three adventurers, um, kind of like, uh, so the, the viewer has the eyes of the dragon looking at these adventures uh, and coming at it. And we've got, I wanted the uh, dwarven geometric uh, arch in the background just to uh, give a little nod to uh, Dwarvity. Yeah. That's cool. And of course you got yeah. the dwarf there as well. So did yeah. he send, did he like, so you just told him that and it said, Hey, this is what I want. And then he turned around with this after a month or so. Yeah, no, it didn't take long at all. Like once, once that man gets, gets the idea up here, it just comes out. He's uh, so brilliant. And, uh, you know, these people are just so talented. They're just amazing artistic talents. So yeah. And then we, um, uh, we just sort of settled on, like, I didn't want them, you know, overly buff. I didn't want them superior in the illustration to, to a monster. I wanted it, uh, to be, you know, coming, coming right at you sort of thing. And, and then, uh, and then we, um, used the fade on the back. So it's actually a three fade. If you know, if you look at it closely and it's not a two fade, which was typical of TSR, it's a three fade. It has a, if you look at the bottom of this illustration, it has just a little bit of purple along the bottom. So that's what we did with the uh, three-tiered fade on the back cover. Yeah, let me just um, see if I can pull that up, actually. Dragon Slayer cover. No, wrong file. There we go. There you go. See, we just put a, we had it going from darker to blue with a little bit of purple at the bottom to reflect the front cover. Yeah, no, it looks fantastic. It really does. And of course, the orange spine, excellent touch. And that's and, a, and new, it, a new OSR uh, logo I'll be using moving forward, which we I developed as well. It's great. It's really great. Yeah, and it's, it's fun because like it's so close to TSR, which was the classic, right? And now it's OSR with old school renaissance, but um, it just really fits well. I really like that. And I don't, you know, you, periodically you see these videos on YouTube, people expressing angst about, you know, the OSR, what does it mean? Or is it dead or what? And I, I'll be honest, I don't get those at all. I, I have no idea what people are talking about. That's just <laughs> noise. Uh, if you're out there and you're a creator or you're thinking about writing a module or a supplement or something like that, you don't pay any of that. It's just noise. Don't pay any mind to that kind of thing. If you have a vision in your mind for what you want to put on paper and you want to call it OSR because OSR means compatible with TSR, D and D, then uh, you go right ahead and don't pay any attention to that stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, I hadn't really heard that kind of chatter. Um, that you know what's happened with the OSR. I, I feel like it's a thriving community because like whenever uh, I'm you know watching videos on youtube or whatever that have to do with it like there's lots of interested people and um and also it's it's servicing a a, a community of people that they they have this um they're real fanboys like they love this old school stuff and we're not getting it from uh our current uh owners of the intellectual property um, mm -hmm. uh, accidentally closed down the book I wanted to have up. There we go. All right. So, yeah, I completely um, agree. Uh, you know, there are, um, that what I try to do when I, I talk about this stuff is that, uh, in order to, if, if you want to make any book, whether it's a game or something else, look like it's from a particular time period, uh, there's an aesthetic space on either side of that called the Uncanny Valley. And, when we all know, like you could be flipping through a book that has OSR on it, right? And then you get partway through and you're like, you look at that art and you're like, wait a minute, like that, 
that doesn't fit or, you know, something's just not right or doesn't look like it fits. It doesn't, it's not natural. And that's because it's sitting in the uncanny valley. Um, and you really need to know what you're doing from an aesthetic standpoint to make sure that you're fit very solidly in those, in the parameters and not in the uncanny valley, just slightly to the right or slightly to the left. And, you know, you have to know the material. You can't know the material. You have to know, you know, the material, which means know it backwards to front, excluding valves. And then from there, you have to say, now what's my vision? And if I was working at TSR in 1982 or 1983, and somebody said, hey, uh, you know, we have this idea for this mega dungeon called Barrel Maze, go. <laughs> then I try to put myself in that time frame to say, well, you know, well, well, what would that look like? And how would it feel? And, and what would I want it to be? And because I don't have any of the pressure constraints that, uh, you know, working at a game company. So uh, I can just, uh, you know, do it till I feel like it's where it should be for a presentation and then and then put it out there. Yeah. And um, now there's going to be six mega dungeons in your series. Right. So how how poor are you going to make me here, Greg? Because I'm going to be picking them all up, and buying them for sure. <laughs> so there's going to be six. We've got four now. Yep. Two left. Yeah, only two um, left. Uh, what, what do you can? You, is there anything you can tell us about those, or is it pretty hush hush secret right now? Well, um, so uh, what I do, my process when I think about uh, an, a starting adventure with my group is like I again going back to the idea of being a visual learner. So I get this idea in my mind, and I can close my eyes and I can see it, and then once I have that image. A lot of the, say, the outline from that image will suggest itself. And then from that outline, you start filling in underneath each of the headers all the things that you want to do uh, or that you need to do to go from A to Z. And then those outlines will get, as you start working through them, will get adjusted. Some might get bounced down or up or whatever, and some, some will get filled out more than others. And then that gives you a working draft. And from there, you can start playing and doing your thing. And then you start filling it out as you go. And it's all, you know, kind of organic. And yeah. uh, at the end of the day, you want it to, uh, you want it to be fun, not only to play, but you want it to be inspiring and engaging for the person who's running the game. Yeah. So like we went to that page 104, right? So mm -hmm. somebody says, okay, well, uh, I'm going to cast uh, Stinking Cloud. So they, they've looked up Stinking Cloud. The DM flips to Stinking Cloud. You see a picture there. And now you're inspired to convey the effect of the spell, right? right? So it's kind of those things that, you know, one thing can lead to another, lead to another. And that's how you need to think about it from a uh, not. So there's the playing part, but then there's the, you know, the the DMs or the GM, whatever, is looking at a lot of this stuff. And you want them to be inspired because you want them making eye contact and conveying all this stuff to their players to get them interested and excited and make it fun to play. Oh, yeah. Well, how, how long did it take you to put Dragon Slayer together? Did it take you longer than it takes to do... Uh... Uh, May Dungeon or less time? Less time because a lot of it was already done. So we had a, a wiki for 30 years, right? Where we where we had some of the information. Then, you know, we had the edits and changes over time. And from there, like when you're thinking about making a role playing game, you need to you need to think um, backwards to front. So, you know, you need to get here. But, but how do you go from here to there? And um, the thing that, the, that makes the most logical sense to me is you start with spells. Okay. Your spells have to be on point. And because, well, why is that? Because some of your magic items will have spell effects. And some of your monsters have abilities or spells, uh, or spell-like abilities, I guess is what I should say, to be more clear. 
So if your spells are not solidly on point, then the whole thing will just be like a will be like a, a tower of cards. It'll just fall over. Right. So you need to start with your spells. And then uh, from there, I went to monsters. And then from there, I went to magic items. And, you know, the spells were like 45,000 words all on their own. And monsters were about another 45,000 words all on their own. Like those are books unto themselves, really. And then I think magic items was 25,000 words uh, ish. So now that you've got your spells, your magic items, and your monsters, then you can you can go to stuff like the what I call the front matter, um, the intro, the races, classes, equipment, all the stuff before spells begin, and then you can go to the back matter, which is combat and exploration and um, tables and. And then after that, the appendices. So, you know, um, the, I love the old saying, you know, how do you eat a whale? You eat a whale one bite at a time. Oh, yeah. And that's exactly how you do it. You you uh, chunk it up and then that way you can wrap your mind around it. But you have to have conviction for what you're doing. And experience helps a great deal as well. So, you know, we've all had, um, I've had discussions with friends about the spell entangle, for example. So there are some people who are like, well, if there's no vegetation in the dungeon, you can't cast Entangle. I'm not really of that school of thought. Like, I think, you know, um, there are mosses and things like that. A druid could cast Entangle and get vines to creep up, creep up between flagstones or whatever. And there are the people that think differently. Uh, but, but that's the question is, how much micromanagement do you want in that? And then... That sends up the flag. Okay, well, you know, my engine is BX. I need to think in BX terms. Let's not micromanage that all the way down to are there roots running in between the flagstones or not? That doesn't need to be uh, micromanaged, in my humble opinion. And I think a lot of reasonable people would feel that way. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. When it when when it gets too specific uh, or or it attempts to be too realistic that that always tends to bog things down a little bit doesn't it and um, I, it's it, always to, a give and take yeah to me um dnd is best when it's a popcorn game so um you know you can you sit at a table you can eat some popcorn you can roll some dice uh you've got some interesting traps and tricks and things like that and occasionally things go awry and occasionally you have a big triumph and a big haul of gold and, and all's well. Um, and it's those ups and downs, but at the end of the day, it's fun with your friends. And the other thing that you need to keep in mind as a game designer is that, you know, somebody like yourself or somebody like me or your son, if you're playing regularly, um, that's not necessarily the mainstay player. Um, to me, the mainstay player is the one who shows up to their monthly game or twice a month game. They don't read forums. They don't take part in groups. Uh, they just show up that night to play. Mm -hmm. And they want to know that magic missile is magic missile and that sleep is sleep. And a longsword does 1d8, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because they don't want to put any more time into it than that. Now, that's ultimately the person that I feel like I'm running for most. Now, does there need to be crunch and little Easter eggs and homages for people like us who really enjoy it and we enjoy reading through these things and all that stuff? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because and that's all like, I, I, yeah. yeah, it's like, um, you know, when you used to see little Easter eggs or homages on album covers or things like that. And it's like, oh yeah, okay, well, I'm, I'm part of that subculture and they understand me. That's why it's there. And I see it. That's awesome. And it's the same yeah. kind of thing with, uh, with this stuff. If the more well-read you are in fantasy fiction, the more well-read um, you are in uh, fantasy and science fiction film and TV, the more you'll be able to pull from these things. It's working like a, it's like Shrek. It's an onion with layers. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's, yeah, that's really cool insight. So, yeah, I wasn't sure quite how you did that, but you, you actually had a pretty systematic way of going about it. And I'm sure by now you would, wouldn't you? After yeah. doing all the mega dungeons that you've done and everything. Um, 
Um, but yeah, no, that, well, that's very. If, if you're not methodical, uh, it's not going to work. Right. Uh, games like this, they're too intricate. Uh, they have too many fiddly bits um, where where things can go go awry. So you have to be on the screws, and you have to be on the screws day after day, week after week, month after month. And uh, then, even then, we need to understand. So you know, you're just like everybody else. You're human. Uh, you know, so you need to periodically you have to read and reread and reread constantly. So you're drafting new material, but you're also spending part of the day rereading and and copy editing these things. So uh, that's really you know important. You have to. You, it's not. You have to do it so constantly that after a while you don't have eyes for the material anymore. Oh yeah, you just read it over it. You you've talked eyes. yourself into things that maybe uh, aren't as smooth um, as they could be in the pros, for example. Right. So yep. I tell I'll take sections and and flog them to friends and mm -hmm. and uh, and I had a number of people uh, that I credited in the book that were really troopers um, to help me out with some copy editing to make sure. I don't say stupid things or I don't say silly things or have a little brain lapse or something like that. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Absolutely. Well, I think I haven't read the whole thing yet. I, I will when it comes to me in print, but um, uh, I, I do think that, you know, it, 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 it does read very clear and, and it's very helpful that way. Let's talk about some of the interior art. Sure. Uh, in here. Like I, I see that, um, well, what we can go to the art credits at the front, right? So interior art, um, we've got a lot of recognizable names. Uh, Ken and James actually uh, seems to come through a lot uh, um, in the yeah. pages in here. And, you know, we, I can see why, because his art is fantastic. And he really does, I think, kind of um, pull together the, the feel that I think you were looking for with mm -hmm. Dragon Slayer RPG. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your working relationship with him, how you discovered him, or you know, um, what made you want to uh, lay out with his artwork through, through the classes and the races and everything? Sure, so I met Kenan at um, GaryCon. He was with a group of, uh, of uh, his local gaming group and um, I didn't know that he was such a kick-ass artist at the time. I just so he's a player, and I, I just met him in a group, and and then uh, I think two or three of us joined his group to have dinner. And uh, you know, I like those Texas uh, Texas guys. I get along with them very well. And so, not long thereafter, I forget exactly how it happened, but um, I was asking around for artists: was anybody available or whatever? And I'm not sure how we connected, but it was for, I think we worked on, on Heifel together. That was the, the first one where you see his stuff. And then, um, so, you know, um, I have no talent as an artist. I'm a decent mini painter, but I can draw you a good stick figure. And so it, it's funny because um, periodically I have in my mind's eye what I want on the page, but I, I will literally draw like the worst stick figure style uh, illustration. And then I'll take a picture of it with my phone and send it to, uh, to Ken. And, and uh, he's like, Oh, you need to just publish this. Like, I don't, I don't actually need to do art here because um, <laughs> he, because the stick figure is just so awesome. Yeah. Uh, so um, I acknowledge how talented, uh, you know, these buggers are. There's just, so amazing uh, to me, Ken and James is the as I've said this before. He's the Dave Trampier of uh, of 2024. He is uh, insanely gifted, and uh, I'm very thankful that that he was willing to work with me and how friendly he is. And he's just a terrific person, great family man, and a good guy. And I'm very lucky to be able to work with him. Well, it seems like a great match between you guys. It really does uh, produce a fantastic product. So. Uh, I think uh, kudos to both of you guys, and and I think we're all glad for your working relationship. And that's a, uh, that's a new font uh, as well for the book. Through, yeah, yeah, right here. This is your Dragon Slayer font, isn't it? Yeah. So actually, the font's called Dragon Slayed. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, cool. Just a bit of fun. Is it trademarked? <laughs> <laughs> no, we just, uh, just I just it. did it for fun uh, because I wanted I wanted I've, I've actually thought about doing um, you know my own unique fonts in the past, but I never met anybody that that had that skill. And then um, so I did, and and it it it, um, it worked out. Looks good. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, no, it looks it looks really cool. It looks great on t shirt too. Both me yeah, and Sunny. Yeah, we got our Dragon Slayer t shirts. We actually made them ourselves because we, you know, they look terrific. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks to you because, like, you know, who 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 how you who did this logo for you? Who did you get for that? Oh, it's a, it's a just a friend of mine who uh, uh, does graphic design. You did great. Oh, it it's looks good. Fantastic. Yeah. So you know, because my uh, my parents are Scottish, um, that's been a very big influence on who I am. And so, you know, just like you see here with the Druid, the little bit of the Celtic knot um, and the the, uh, the dragon Celtic knot on your shirt, um, you know, represent it's, it's beginning and end, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so these are the kind of things that uh, I, I like to flavor. Because, you know, my game is really, my home game is really based in kind of like a medieval England, medieval Scotland. And so that's why you see a lot of the standing stones, a lot of the barrow mounds, things of that nature. And uh, and so when I can, I like to include um, a little bit of knot work here and there just to aesthetically reinforce everything. And, and it's such a fantastic art form. Uh, I think it just uh, leaps off the page, particularly in black and white. Yeah, it really does. I mean, it, it looks great. It, it really does give that medieval feel that really is inspiring for players and dms and know, if you so go I, back if you go back and you look at material from from the from you know 79 80 81 82 83 tsr did a lot of that right yeah because they knew they were, what they were tapping into for inspiration you know they knew they knew their source material aesthetically and they played to it and they also knew their audience and they played to their audience and so that's really key. Like whether you're writing a recipe book, a role-playing game or whatever, you have to know your audience. And um, I know my audience and, uh, and, I, and my audience, you know, are people like yourself who are, um, uh, they've seen multiple editions come and go. They've, um, they're looking for a little bit of an intellectual challenge They'd like a fresh take on material that they know. They don't necessarily want to learn a new system, but they do like fresh takes and they want to be challenged. And um, that's a really hard group to write for because everyone is so bright and everyone is so um, well-versed and familiar. And if uh, if I can write for them then and, and they're happy, then I'm, I know my audience and I'm, I'm uh, being successful. So uh, if, you know, that's, um that's one of the things i take pride in yeah well i mean uh, yeah proof is in the pudding right because uh your, your uh, mega dungeons are highly successful they're uh, very popular and very well regarded and you know i, I think uh, just looking through um dragon slayer it is objectively well done you know like you you look at it and it, it's it's not just that oh i have an affinity towards this because i love D, D from 70s and 80s era but it's like wow i mean this is this is done with a lot of care this is done in a smart way mm -hmm. and uh, it really comes across to the person looking at it so so the inspiration for this druid comes from the film the first 15 minutes of the film the eagle uh, about a, a Roman soldier in Britain, and uh, there's a battle with a Druidic shaman um, and a, a Roman garrison early in the film, and I was like, "That, that is the dude uh, I want for the the Druid." So that was the inspiration for that illustration. Yeah, I, I've heard you say that before. Is that the one where they steal the 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 eagle icon? And yeah, so, yeah. The uh, so the. The, the eagle uh, standard has been missing uh, for some time. And uh, and the movie is about going on this adventure to try to find it. 
Now, the one I watched, I think it was dubbed over from another language. Is that the same one, or is there more than is there more than one rendition? No, I think I want to remember the lead actor's name. Is it Channing Tatum? Um, oh, that one. Okay, so it's Channing Tatum version. Okay. Now, don't quote me on that. I'm terrible with actor names, but uh, I, th I want to say that one's correct. Okay. All right. It's got Channing Tatum in it anyway. Okay. Well, that, I'll add that to the list of uh, you know movies to watch. So it's pretty rad. Good. The first fifteen minutes are good. Yeah. Well, that sounds cool. Yeah, I you know I I kind of missed the train on the whole Conan movies thing too. I've I've never actually seen them just like because like I was one of the younger in my family and I kind of watched the movies that my older brothers watched and Conan mm -hmm. just wasn't really part of our corpus, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, saw like Commando and like uh, other Arnold movies and stuff like that. Of course, when I was a kid, probably when I was way too young to watch those movies. But you know, <laughs> just because I had older brothers. <laughs> yeah, I know. I uh, my my older brother wasn't into fantasy adventures, so but anything that came up that's fantasy adventure, I would watch uh, for sure. And uh, there's a lot of inspiration from the um, Robin Hood, uh, Robin of Sherwood. Uh, BBC TV series in in my work. Oh, yeah. okay. That was a very influential '80s TV series. Oh yeah, I had never heard of that, but that's kind of interesting. Yeah, so Hearn the Hunter, uh, coming from English folklore. Oh uh, yes. The uh, the Arrow of Hearn, Green Man, right? Um, all that stuff, super super cool. Yeah, no, that is really cool. Uh, yeah, because like, yeah, the way you draw on that area of europe it really is um really does put in a flavor into the game that uh makes it appealing for people that are just looking for that old school experience i feel like i think you just hit it right in the right spot there well uh, if you think if you think about it just to jump on there and add to your point um there there's nothing more uh that that sort of sparks the imagination to look at a standing stone that's been there for 6,000 years um, or uh, a barrel mound. Um, and then to know the engineering it took to build it and that it, these things were oriented often to the uh, winter solstice or uh, the summer solstice or one of the equinoxes. Um, and you can stand with your back to the entrance to these mounds with your compass and it will read true like they this is these things are very very purposeful and we're talking like 5,500 years ago in the case of say Ireland where I was in June so that's really fascinating so yeah. uh, that's the kind of thing that um that uh I've always drawn on will continue to draw on and uh maybe part of one of the next um mega dungeons yeah well that's great that is that sounds really cool um let's talk about some of your uh unique additions here so for one thing like you took a completely different take on the monk class and i take this is a point of pride for me because i i i feel like i had a hand in like steering your decision on that a little bit uh, uh, because i said well you know you were asking about should we include the monk in 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 one of your Facebook groups, and I said something about, well, maybe as an optional class, or or maybe like just do a monk that's like a European style monk, and you liked that comment, and I think you ran with it after that. Uh, people like this. Oh people yeah, they been, do. Yeah, I I think so. I think people have been like latching on to this and are really excited about this unique change you know because yeah we still have a monk class and but it feels eurocentric and like it fits within the genre and uh you know and yeah it just looks like a ton of fun to play too you can tell yeah, any, so I'm, i've been playing at um um conventions i've been going at for a couple of years now and uh people they want to play monks and cyclop cyclops <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, there's like a fight at the table to play the monks and the uh, cyclopsmen but so, yeah so so the in just to to lay it out for folks in ad and d the monk was a subset of the thief class that never made sense to me uh the monk was more of a shaolin eastern monk that never made sense to me now that doesn't mean 
you can't, uh, you know, take the, if you wanted to play Dragon Slayer and just take the AD&D monk and bring it over, you could totally do that if you like really have your heart set on it. So don't think that, you know, you have to live or die with this one. But this one fits, as you pointed out, so much better in a Western European milieu. And uh, I think that uh, it has some fun twists and um, yeah. makes for excellent uh, role playing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Go ahead, Sonny. I really like how... Uh, I really like how the monk just feels sort of like... Uh, not like they're going to like uh, become Bruce Lee like in five seconds and draw kick a dragon. But more like they're going to sort of kind of gives you the spiritual journey type mm -hmm. feeling. But uh, I don't know. I see the spare not the rod and I just keep thinking about uh, Teddy Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so to me, some of the core items are the, uh, so for the monk from the class standpoint, uh, had to be like the, the monk is highly maneuverable on the, on the, on the battlefield. That was important. That needed to stay. Um, they uh, have some strengths and, and bonuses, but they don't get to wear armor. Uh, so, you know, those things needed to stay. So those are consistent with the uh, AD&D class. And what I chose to do was make the um, monk a quarterstaff specialist. And speaking of that TV show I mentioned, Robin of Sherwood, mm -hmm. the Friar Tuck uh, character in, in the film, you, you'll see a bit of that here. And then also uh, the inspiration from the um, uh, Sean Connery film uh was it the name of the rose oh yes yeah yeah they were monks yeah were and then the monastery and then the twist that that i wanted in particular here yeah no that that looks awesome and uh kenan did a great job on the art too because um when when you think of like a european monk <laughs> you do kind of think of friar tuck and he's got like a meat in his hand and he's fat so th this uh, actually makes the guy look like pretty cool you know what i mean yeah, and, so and, and playable the brief here was i wanted the look to be stern and minimalistic mm -hmm. and then that's reflected in the mechanics like they i think there's 20 gold pieces they're allowed to carry they got to give everything away they're supposed to be poor they're so they're not interested in worldly possessions there's a higher calling at play and uh, and then what people can do is they can tie that into whatever deities they would like to have in their game. Mm -hmm. And when I do the map in Gazetteer um, later on in 25, then uh, I'll, I'll lay out all the deities so far uh, in there that have been in my books and, and uh, expand on them. And people want to use them in the game. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, you do have the Gazetteer... Is it going to be a series of gazetteers coming out to about just a single one? Just one, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm not a, I'm not really a splat book man, and quite honestly, if people weren't, people really were hot to trot on the gazetteer and the map, and that's something I actually wanted to do at the end when the other two adventures are done. But I, I'm going to steal my thunder a little bit by doing the gazetteer and the map and, and releasing that in advance. But it's. Uh, um that's fine it's no no problem and if it allows people to if they want to play in that world and they want to situate their home campaign in that world then they can start doing that and on all the last two mega dungeons are only going to add so that you know they're not going to take away they will only add to to the existing um uh, campaign world that that's my home game well uh same thing with the the mega dungeon monster manual right like i know that you had planned on doing this um at at the end of the six in the series That's right and people were clamoring for it and so you you came out with, are you going to do a, a monster manual too right yeah so that'll have when when the last two adventures are done in years down the road then i'll do an update for the the mega dungeon monster manual and um and uh put all the monsters in there so and what i did was i don't have it on my desk right now but downstairs what i did was i took dragon slayer 
And then I took my Mega Dungeon Monster Manual. So these were these were printed out, not the actual hard books, but printed out PDFs. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, I took them and I had them leather bound together so that yeah, it's all in one one book for me. Oh, that's just my, my okay. DMing copy. Oh, yeah, that's neat. Oh, cool. I, I like having them uh, in this format. It, it, I just think this is gorgeous. This Peter Mullen art is so That's awesome. right, yeah. I love mm -hmm. it. It is just fantastic. And then when you go through the book, like, it, I mean, standard fare for your products, like, but it, it's just, it, it just absorbs you. There's, it is so awesome going through here. It's just like going through an old um, uh, monster manual from TSR, but better because every entry has a picture, you know, not mm -hmm. just most of them or many of them every single one has one and they're all really really well done um love it i i can't give enough high praise for, for that and you know these other products like when i first started really diving into barrel maze um it was like i i knew it was going to be good because everyone was talking about how good it was but i didn't really realize how good until i actually was like getting into it and i was just like oh man I got to tell Greg how good this is. And mm -hmm. then <laughs> but like, a, I kind of thought, well, that's, that's dumb. Like he, he knows, like everyone tells him that all the time, but like, I got to tell him. <laughs> it, well, no, I, no, I appreciate yeah. that very much. And it's very kind. And, uh, you know, um, uh, a good creative, it, whether it's art or music or writing or games, we beat ourselves up. We do. Nobody is yeah. harder on us than we are on ourselves. And, so, and what I've learned, and I, you know, any young person that's out there listening, I would encourage them to think like this. So if you're working on a project and then you get frustrated and it's like, this is no good. Everyone's going to hate it. Um, I'm not, it's just not good. You know, that, that's actually a very healthy uh, thing to say to yourself, to be reflective like that, because what it means is it's important to you, that you want it to be good. And it just means that that day, you're not on your game and your writing isn't going that well, or, you know, the revision of your notes isn't going that well, but tomorrow will be a new day and you may get inspiration to write around or through that little bit of a block that you had that one day. And, and you'll be, uh, you know, three days later, you'll be, you know, running and, and not even worrying about that. You had a little bit of a mental block for a day. So, you know, that thing, that kind of uh, self-doubt is very, very helpful. It's a, it's a, it's part of being a creative and I encourage people to embrace it. It means it's important to you and, uh, and accept it as part of the process. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I can kind of identify with that too. Um, I, I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was uh, about Sonny's age and uh, I, yeah, I just drew all the time, you know, and um, I, I ended up uh, for practical reasons deciding that ah, I think I'm going to not go with that for plan A uh, because I just I wanted to have a, a you know, I want to provide for a nice size family and things. So I just kind of did more practical things, but I I still can draw. I don't really have a great portfolio uh, or a lot of time to put one together. But, um, you know, anyway, I. I I can definitely identify with that. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's it's really great advice. Um, looking at some of these classes again, um, I mean, we have the monk, which is really awesome. I love the druid and the way it's done. Uh, this guy's getting some free dental work done. Right he here. sure is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I love the, would you say this is like a Norman uh, yeah. style dress? It's awesome. Like, I just love that. I, I love that look. It's the kind of thing you see right off of a tapestry or something, you know? Yeah. So um, the brief, the brief for the fighter here was a Norman knight. I wanted the uh, helmet and nose guard, that sort of thing. And, uh, and then we just, what we did is we actually had the checkered part also on the right side of his, um, of his, uh, of his uh, vestment there. But then we decided to, we needed to dial it back. It was a little too busy. So we took that off the, the right side and I think it was interesting. Yeah, no, it's great. It's fantastic. And then look at this like splash pages with the, that particular fighter, little yeah. dragon. This looks so good. It's really awesome. Yeah, that's it's kind of reminiscent of uh, the B 
BX art a little bit. Just uh, lacking the sorceress. Yeah, like look at that that jet black background, and then mm -hmm. uh, you know just this uh, white uh, inked in. I just yeah, it's just great, you know. Yeah, well, you know, there's a way you know, in the the black uh, using negative space is really a skill, and but we're also using so the black space is just black, but and we, but that's actually suspenseful. And then some of the white space around the front claws there, it's just empty. I mean, you could fill it in yep. with whatever your mind thinks. Is it treasure? Is it his body? Is it whatever? That's so what it is in my having... mind. Yeah, like golden treasure. That's why it's so bright, you know? It's just kind of shiny. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. Awesome. The Barbarian. Okay, so the Barbarian, it looks amazing, I have to say. Um, so what kind of tweaks did you make to the Barbarian? Because I know that it was a little bit, uh, a little bit broken in in a d and d it would have come out of the uh unearthed arcana um book right that's so, right so what what did you do for barbarians that you think really helped it so the barbarian that we've been using uh for my game has always been more of the uh the conan um like fighter thief or barbarian thief so we wanted to uh keep that. And then um, when we had the Berserk Rage as part of it, and then some of the other things were added just for flavor and fun. So um, the uh, the totem animal. So what you do, you know, Viking warriors and and others would uh, would uh, envision themselves gaining strength from uh, the wolf or strength from a bear or something like yeah. that. So uh, we we thought that would be a fun add, and yeah, then. Cool. Some of the other ones on the next page, like uh, I always get I, the funniest thing in here is coward sense. Um, a barbarian <laughs> has a passive eight percent chance per level of detecting a backstab or any melee attack from behind. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, I just think that's super funny because you know they're supposed to be uh, you know the strong silent type and uh, and and a little bit wary of magic, a little bit wary of outsiders. So you do see a little bit of the UA um, of the barbarian here relative to uh you know not liking sorcerers and sorcery having some magic scorn but it's not like you know the the, the, UA, the ua barbarian wasn't really playable and uh this is much more playable and it has a little bit of whimsy to it too yeah yeah the what sorcery is this <laughs> that was awesome yeah Did you come up with that yourself i mean that's really fun yeah so <laughs> You probably know from looking at the appendices, I, I like to have a little bit of fun with some of the sage advice um, titles. Yeah. And I was having a little bit of fun here. That's like, uh, um, oh, geez, uh, why am I mind blanking on the uh, uh, Thundar the Barbarian? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. No, I, just, I, love, yeah. I love seeing that kind of stuff. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I, actually have a, I actually have a quick question for the Barbarians. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the race limits, actually, what made you decide to only pick a human unlimited? Um, because, uh, you know, it's playing an architect. And, yeah. um, you know, if you're thinking like an elf, like an elf is going to be, they're going to live so much longer. Everything they do is going to be more highly skilled. It's going to be more refined. Uh, so there's really no need for a, an elven barbarian. The only other option yeah. probably would have been a half orc. Um, and uh, but but um, I'm playing to the archetype of of the barbarian, so that would be the reason why. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think one of the good things early D and D did is it established those archetypes. So the whole game was um, to to oversimplify. It was rules based rather than exception based. So if you compared, um, say, A, D, and D to uh, three point five, right, uh, and you said, okay, which one is rules based, which one is exception based? Um, three five, five is definitely exception based, and we've got all these tiny little fonts uh, with, you know, <laughs> all this paper. information crammed. <laughs> For all the way through with all these exceptions. Now, if you're 11, 12, and you've got absolutely nothing to do, um, maybe that's your game at the time. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not the game I want to play. Yeah. Um, it's not a popcorn game. It's a rules lawyery game, and that's not fun to me. Yeah. But to each their own, and I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I think it's phenomenal. I think the barbarian, like the look of it is awesome. And, you know, uh, I love that he's got these, you know, sp special abilities, but it's not, it's not over the top. Uh, One of the fun things thing there uh, the, on the bo bottom of the previous page. So this is something that we added taunting. So taunting a barbarian may induce berserker rage. A successful <laughs> intelligence check negates. Now, of course, they're going to have low intelligence, so it's probably not going to work. But, you know, <laughs> like barbarians are very, you know, they're kind of high strung. Um, and if yeah. they uh, yeah, get insulted, yeah. <laughs> then a, a fight could immediately break out. So I, that's just a little bit of a fun um, role play uh, item. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't take teasing too well, huh? <laughs> no, old fashioned. <laughs> Old fashioned yeah. tavern <laughs> brawl after they accidentally breathe on you wrongly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then the paladin is is great. Like that looks fantastic. It's perfect for paladin. Yeah. So there's um the, the so we start with the standard paladin here with just a little bit of flavor, a little bit from the UA. So it the it's the paladin with just a hint of cavalier. And, and I think that's where it needed to be in the first place. So we keep, you know, the religious uh, crusader warrior uh, paladin very clearly here. Then, but we throw in the um, the lance specialist and a couple other items. Uh, they there is a chance that they can start off the game with plate mail, which the old paladin didn't do, but the uh, UA cavalier, you know, could have like full plate mail or whatever. So just a, just a little, a few bones, uh, just a little spice sprinkled in there relative to the Cavalier. Yeah, no, that's great. And they can turn undead as well, which is cool. Yeah, I like the Forsworn just to make it really clear to, uh, to everybody. A Paladin must defend the weak and the infirm. A Paladin cannot commit evil or observe evil with indifference. Severe alignment deviation strips a Paladin of all abilities, and she or he refers to a fighter. Yeah. Yep. No. That's Definitely cool. fixes the uh, the fifth edition whole edge lord paladins. <laughs> yeah. What are they have bad paladins? Is that what it is, Sonny? <laughs> yeah, you're allowed to play as an evil paladin. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it kind of takes no makes the whole thing mean. No, I, I'm I'm not going <laughs> to let that happen to like I'm not going to let a player play an evil paladin. However, if I want a good uh, uh, antagonist. I'm, I might use this template to create uh, an evil paladin, you know, yeah. as a, as the big bad guy kind of Forces thing. Of and sure. Yeah, yeah. And that's fine. Kind of, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. That would be cool. And oh, this looks so cool. Looks so good, Greg. Um, Something tells me so, those skeletons are not going to be all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the the spell so they get the cleric spells and um i think it was the ranger did in in um ad and d did the ranger get cleric spells or there was something that was like they did yeah. and that never made sense to me the yeah. ranger should be getting druid spells because mm -hmm. um, the nature connection yeah exactly they're in the wilderness doing their thing they're interacting with druids they're you know uh, so that never made any sense to me at all. Um, so yeah, the rangers get druid spells, and but and the paladin would get cleric spells, and it also distinguishes the classes a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, maybe maybe you don't want to go full blown druid, but you kind of like their spells, and you'd like to be you know a little bit of a frontline fighter. Ranger's the way to go. And mm -hmm. I know that Josh was really impressed with this class uh, when we were thumbing through it in one of our other videos he, he thought it was really fun I, I looked at it and i'm like oh boy <laughs> should i play anything else <laughs> i mean yeah i like they're... sneaking and i like beating things up yeah and they're like the lone wolf right so they get a yeah. few more hit points than the fighter they have to because you know they're out there defending little villages and things like that they're working on their own um, so yeah, and you know, in uh, AD and D, they have up to 16 hit points, um, excluding their uh, their uh, constitution adjustment. So, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's another thing like the hit dice are, are quite high. Uh, do you have any comments about that? Because I guess we're, we're used to BS, we, we play old school essentials currently, right? So, um, D12 is, is enormous, and I know this is, I think, the highest one 
of the class. Yeah, but okay. it was a, if I recall correctly, it was two D eight for the ranger in AD and D. Uh, everything yeah. else is Whoa. consistent with yeah. AD and D. So the fighter would have ten, the cleric would have eight, the druid would have eight, and so on and so on. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. They kind of scale that one back, actually. All right. Cool. Mm -mm. And the good. fast packs are there for that. You know, so, so if, like, let's say, I don't know, um, you have somebody in your game who um, who's never played before, and they're like, well, how much gold do I get? And this is a big, long list of items, and I don't know what I need. Well, you can just quickly facilitate play. Or if you're, if you're uh, running a game, and you're like, I need to make a... Uh, an NPC party, what gear do they have? You can just choose from these if you like. Yeah. Uh, it speeds things along. Yeah, it really does. Because I don't know who wants to really spend that much time role playing, you know, going to the store. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, maybe on a limited basis, if, if like the st shopkeeper might be a, a recurring NPC that, you know, you get info from or something, but like really. Uh, yeah, th this is this is good to have. And it, yeah, it, it, it's you know it also it it, it kind of sets your players up with the tools that they would need instead of them just yeah. kind of guessing and oh I guess I should have bought this or that and I don't have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah role playing the, going uh, to the and, store can be fun, but there's only so much theater a theater kid can do. Yeah, exactly. There's only so much you can do with it, and that finds inspiration in uh, the Lost City module where they had uh, a page called Yield Fast Pack. Oh, they did. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. That's one of the that's one of the the basic modules. Yes, that's right. Days. Very popular. So, Great art by Jim Holloway in that adventure too. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so Magic User. So I was we were surprised when we were looking through with Magic User because. Um, you know, traditionally, magic user gets one spell at level one, at least in, in BX. I, th I think it's the same in advance. Is that true? Um, well, it depends on, on your intelligence bonus. Oh, okay. So you can have more than one. Uh, that does make sense. If, you know, if you do, do have a high intelligence that, um, you know, you're going to have additional spells. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, hey, what I have here is the Gygax rule. So um, Gygax home rule was uh, if you have... For cleric wisdom fifteen or a magic user intelligence fifteen, you get plus one first level spell and plus one second level spell, and that was his house rule. Oh yeah, well that's great. Yeah, because the the magic user actually starts out with like a pretty good stock of spells to begin with. Is what yeah, well they they should be able to read and write uh, read uh, magic, detect magic, and write magic. That's Pretty, I, I couldn't see it being any other way. And there's yeah. a table in the AD and D DM guide that that does something very similar to what you see here. Oh yeah, okay. So if you're ever wondering, um, hmm, I wonder why Greg did this. Odds are there's precedent. Okay. Yeah. I don't do do things too uh, too far off um, my source material. Yeah, not not too much that's right out of left field. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the Skyclossman goes, um, did you get that from Crawl, or is that is that where your uh, inspiration for it is? Yeah, the inspiration came from Crawl, but um, you know, I what I wanted when I did Dwero Deep. Um, so I've got this human village that was basically occupied by the dwarves when they were driven out of their of their mountain home, and there's a little bit of antagonism between the dwarves and the humans. But I wanted a third group in there to uh, not not make the dynamic in the in the town boring. Yeah. So then I thought, okay, well, geez, you know, Cyclopsmen have never really been done in in D and D before. Um, like we I think we had Cyclopskin in the uh, in the second Monster Manual, but it wasn't really like a playable race. And then so I wanted this group in town that could influence the dynamic one way or the other. And uh, they're very, you know, they're kind of modeled after me a bit. Um, and uh, and I just, uh, I wanted something. If you have two. So options. we have all these humans. Humans are, are probably <laughs> the tallest. I wanted somebody taller than a wow. human, but I didn't want, uh, and I want something that added to 
it just wasn't like a reshuffling of the deck. So we've got these. So I thought it'd be fun, you know, um, as we know, being a tall person, you know, I was always the tallest in my class. So I was called, you know, all the tall uh, nicknames and, and I had to learn <laughs> to take it in stride. And then, of course, the shortest kids in the class, well, they got names, too. And, yeah. you know, if you had big feet like I do, then you got called those names. So um, I thought we saw I thought it'd be fun. It's an interesting dynamic to think, OK, well, um, how would the Cyclopsmen interact with like the halflings? And because they're, they're kind of going to be chided because one's too big and one's too small. Uh, they're probably good friends. I mean, they're they're in this human centric world, and uh, and it is what it is, and, and they probably have empathy for, empathy for each other. And I thought that's an interesting way of thinking about it. So uh, yeah, that's kind of like the the starting point was crawl, and then I wanted to, uh, and then I thought, well, you know, the cyclopsmen, they're kind of they don't say a whole lot, and uh, and they're good craftsmen, and they're very they're skeptical of magic. Um, they're probably going to be pretty good friends with dwarves because dwarves are kind of that way too. Mm. And uh, so then, and that just seemed uh, pretty natural. And of course, and I have numbers that repeat in my adventures. So the number nine uh, was repeating in, in Dwero Deep, 666 repeats in Barrow Maze. Um, <laughs> I've got these, these things where Ooh, you're that's looking good at them. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Like, that's, that's good, good luck. luck. <laughs> yeah. That's a good uh, luck number, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, they're just like little tips of the cap to like heavy metal subculture. And also too, like if you know your, your Christian lore, you know, uh, the number three, the number seven, the number 12. I mean, we've got these numbers that repeat in, in various ways, right? And I think that's fascinating. And it's, uh, the, it's, a, it's the subcurrent of our culture. And to tap into that subcurrent um makes it timeless to me yeah no absolutely i think that's what made the star wars movies such a hit in the beginning you know because uh, george lucas was really um tapping into those archetypes of, of good versus evil and all that stuff so you know when you when you when you tap into that kind of uh identifiable um material uh, you know it resonates with people you know and it makes right. a good product but when everyone's like a you know um like <clears throat> there's no clear difference between good and evil because the orcs are just misunderstood and you know right. everyone's an anti-hero uh dragonborn paladin uh <laughs> it, it, it nothing's like that you know and it is ends up being kind of boring there's no great struggle you know there's no right you know <clears throat> So anyway, yeah, that's. Well, I completely agree with you. Uh, so, you know, if we if we want to talk, just talk about deities for a moment, you know, a lot of the deities as they appear in um, uh, Scandinavian myth, as they appear in Christian myth, as they appear in um, pre-Christian myth in Britain, uh, even in India, like a lot of these things are uh, Indo-European, right? So everyone's got their version of Odin. Everyone's got their version of of an agriculture deity, and and um, and these are variations off that Indo-European theme. So, and you know, we we've got you know the number nine repeats in other ways, and I mentioned seven and twelve and three, and and so these things aren't spe specific necessarily to Christian uh, folklore uh, or or lore. That rather um, they do they do have fingers that extend out um, back to that. Uh, Proto-European or Indo-European um, understanding of deities, and I think that's another interesting thing to tap into as well. Yeah, it's something that's been with us for you know since the beginning, I guess. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, can you tell us about the Illusionist? What what did you do uh, unique with the Illusionist that uh, would have improved him from earlier? Because you're saying that illusionists were hoes. In what way and how did you fix them? Well, so I'm not actually a big fan of illusionists. Um, it's not a class that uh, really gets me excited. Although, hey, everyone likes their... Some people like dwarves. Some people like half orcs. Some people like the illusionist. I get it. Um, yeah. But, you know, uh, from the standpoint of spell lists, uh, I think 
my question was, okay, let's say we're rolling, we're going to play and we're going to roll up a party of adventures. And um, somebody says, okay, well, you know, I'm going to be an illusionist and nobody else wants to be a magic user. Well, to me, the party should still be able to function uh, with a quote unquote magic user that's an illusionist. So, you know, some of those um, key things that, that the magic user has built in should also be part of the spell list for the illusionist. So at the end of the day, I added to the druid spell list. I added to the illusionist spell list. Some of the spells are crossovers, some have been switched, and some are new. But I also added to the magic user spell list significantly. So the magic user has like three pages of spells, the illusionist one, the cleric one, the druid one. But right. so I'm keeping Gygax's pet cat as the magic user, but I'm filling out the opportunities for the illusionist and the druid. Okay. And I hope... I hope that, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I tied the, the gnome illusionist as more like that, that one race that's very um, ad, uh, adept to, at, at illusion magic. So brought that in here and they get a little bonus to uh, the duration of their spells. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And they get the same sort of thing as a magic user. So they get their, uh, you know, their... Um, uh, read, detect magic, and yeah. um, read magic and write, but then they also get an offensive, a defensive, and a utility spell specific to them. Yeah, it makes them usable right off the bat, Where whereas uh, otherwise, yeah. like, your magic user, level one, it's like, okay, he did his one spell, just let's get him out of the way so that no one touches him, otherwise he's dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> yeah, no, I like I've that. I've got a little uh, spell in there. Um, you can see um, under offensive number five, uh, Zigig's Phantasmal Mancatcher. So it's uh, a, a spell that, that acknowledges Gygax's fascination with pole arms. Oh yeah, the picture. <laughs> but also helps out. Also helps out the illusionist. <laughs> yeah, I remember there's a picture of that. Yeah. Mancatcher. Let's see. And there's our spell list. Oh, uh, yeah. I know there was a... It's right at the end of the spell section. Uh, it's like the last page or the second last page, if I recall correctly. Got the berries, got the... Mm. Yeah, do a big jump. You're in the Fs. <clears throat> there you go. Ps, Ss. Oh, wait, maybe... There you go. Right there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like a pig face dork too. I love it. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. So this is kind of like a one of those homage things, huh? Yeah, it's just a little bit of a fun uh, spell for the uh, illusionist and also tip of the cap on homage to Gary Gygax. Oh, that's great. That's a lot of fun. Um, I wanted to now the thief class the thief has been is notorious for being broken right and i i think that everybody kind of acknowledges that there's problems um tell us about what you did to fix the thief class that was one of the things that i was most interested in hearing about how how would greg have fixed the thief because we all know there's issues there <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I fixed the thief by not allowing thieves for many years. That's how I fixed, <laughs> fixed the thief. Um, so what I said, you're all thieves and you all get a base chance to do anything, find traps, remove them, whatever. And that solved the thief problem. Uh, but I realized the amount of uproar if I didn't have a thief. So what I did was the secret here to the thief is actually on the next page. Okay. And um, where I talk about the, the skills and things. So uh, on the bottom half of the page here, what I've tried to do with that little paragraph is to make it clear that when you're playing thief skills, mm -hmm. the uh, that's it there, the 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 qualitative um, discussion of finding a trap, removing a trap, etc., and so forth, always precedes a die roll. So, uh, having said that, I like. That that's a qual that the mechanic of these skills can be qualitatively done. 
Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that the person who's running the game that's running the dungeon has to know what the mechanism of activation is for the trap. Are we talking a tripwire? Are we talking a, uh, a, a descending stone? Are we talking, um, you know, uh, a, a trigger, uh, a wire trigger on a door that fires a crossbow? Whatever the, the trap that has to have a mechanism of activation. Now, if, if the person running the game knows that, then that makes, that gives the, the, the PCs an opportunity to investigate qualitatively uh, whether a trap is present or not. And quite honestly, if they take the time, they'll probably find them. So if, if for example, if they're going down a hallway looking for a pit and they're using a 10 foot pole or they're pouring water from time to time to see if it drains off, if they're doing those things, they're going to find a pit trap unless it's a highly unusual pit trap. If they um, are investigating a lock on a chest and they're inspecting it very closely without touching it, they might notice, oh, well, there's a small hole above the lock that seems unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, a, a lot of traps can be qualitatively deciphered by players by asking great questions, which is like rule one of Dragon Slayer right in the introduction. So what I have here with this paragraph is to encourage people when you when you role play traps, do so qualitatively. And then once you've exhausted that method of deciphering a trap and all things are equal, the, the uh, DM can roll the roll percentage dice for the thief's um, for ability. So that's how I've addressed the thief skill brokenness. Nice. Well, and I also see up here, I mean, the percentages are quite a bit higher at level one than what I wouldn't say to. quite a bit, but they're higher. So, yeah. you know, the thing that sucks most. So if you're thief, what you really want to do is backstab. But the yeah. percentages were so impossibly low in AD&D, you were just dreadful at it. Like it's almost impossible because you have to both um, hide in shadows and um, move silently. And move silently. Yeah. So it was not going to happen. This makes it, this makes it, um, it's not a huge jump, but it's a, a bump. It's, I think it's more appropriate to allowing a thief to do something like a backstab. So to, to do backstab in Dragon Slayer, are we talking about, do you have to do uh, hide in the shadows and move silently? Both yeah, still? it's, on, it's okay. just above on the next page. Okay, all right. And also, too, there are some other things about the uh, thief skills that kind of bug me a bit, like, um, Okay, well, the thief says, I want to move silently. Mm -hmm. So the DM says, okay, they roll dice, determine that the thief moves silently by the dice and tells the player, you think you're moving silently. So, but how far? Like, how long does that go? Um, that was never really determined. Right. Yeah. So I've added little bits into the into the thief skills that give the DM a little more guidance on exactly how to play those things out. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I, I've heard talk about like sheer surfaces and stuff where, you mm -hmm. know, people interpret that as like a, a sheet of glass you know, or something silly. Like, uh, no, I don't. Spider-Man. Spider-Man. <laughs> Spider-Pig. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they have can, like magic gloves. Yeah, I think can move on, on a sheer surface, uh, but um, but a regular player can't. Um, and that's you know they're they have uh, they're taught the ancient art of these thieves uh, guilds, and uh, you know to where to how, how to manipulate crannies in ways that other people can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's got to be some kind of handhold that make it possible. Right. <laughs> that's right. We're not talking uh, sheer is an absolutely sheer no. devoid of, no. of premises. I mean, I'm sure they'll run it. If you know, a good DM will throw that at players just for fun. Yeah. I would. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good trap where all the crevices disappear and they just <laughs> moves out. Um, the hit dice went up to, you know, D6 from D4, which I think is welcome. It kind of makes the them a little bit of a... That's you know, standard for AD&D. &D. Is it okay? All right, because I'm I'm thinking BX on our end, and so that's their D4 and BX, and 
it's uh, it's dicey. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, Good. with the way that the thieves have been uh, hit dice, so I see that they're just they're kind of like the guy in between the magic user and the they're kind of like in between the magic mm -hmm. user and the mid middle fighters type guy. From a hit die standpoint, yeah. 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 And they're also well. the thief levels faster than all the other um all the other classes. So they get the benefit of an additional die there before others do. Yeah. Yeah, which is uh useful because they're gonna need it. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's good. And then we have the assassin um which it looks great. It looks very cool. Um lots of poison and disguise stuff uh so that's really neat for people who like that yeah yeah again you know i'm not a, i'm not a huge assassin fan either i think they're better as antagonists than they are as protagonists but um you know to each their own uh everything's there and uh if you want to play your you know classic assassin yeah yeah that's right yeah um and then we're off to alignments and things like that so Mm -hmm. it's just so much uh, th there's so much in here really really um uh, someone looking into buying this they ought to know that this is very much a complete tome it has everything in it that you would need to play um it's got all your character creation stuff it's got your spells it's got your monsters which is a, probably the largest section of the book um mm -hmm. this is, these are the spells here monsters are i think right here um and uh, <clears throat> it's got your magic items and things like that. It even has at the back, um, you know, how to create a dungeon and how to create an outdoor adventure. And, uh, you know, here we are, adventure design. Um, so that's a fairly standard. There's there's two here. This is the fairly standard kind of Moldvay approach, which takes, mm -hmm. usually this is something for, uh, you know, somebody has some experience. But then I also have a procedural methodical uh, dungeon creator that if you've never done it and you're not sure what to do, you can just follow the process and right here. And you can yep. just follow that along. And and uh, and then I put in a sample dungeon as well. Yeah, which is great, you know, because uh, I mean, in order to I just think this is a really good ad. This is a very good ad into the product because I can see someone going out to get like a dungeon generator product i have to have myself um but if you buy dragon slayer you actually have that built into the product already and not just anybody's uh dungeon generator greg gillespie's dungeon generator you know the the mega dungeon guy you know it's just known throughout the industry for his mega dungeons here he's given us this template of how to build dungeons uh for our campaign and so I, I think that just that alone uh, is is a very very useful thing and very just drives up the value really high. I think one of those little things that you added in there that really really uh, spices it up quite a bit, Greg. Well, it's also nice and useful about the. Uh, sorry for cutting you off, Greg. No, you know, it's nice and useful about the uh, the dungeons sort of listed here. It said there's a lot of opportunity for bottlenecking, which I know very much saves an entire party all the time <laughs> anyway uh sorry the bottlenecks you know where their numbers can't count um and you know but that's all part of thinking through dungeon creation you know but even then and you think through this stuff right and then you play test it and then of course players don't do what you uh, anticipate uh they'll go around from the other side where you had your bottleneck set up so uh you know th those things always happen but um and but you play test them out and and, and take it from there uh, and you know the other the, the weird thing that about about a rule book that's different than a mega dungeon is that you're you're writing for uh, the veteran player, but you're also writing for you have to assume at some point someone's going to pick up one of these books that's never played uh, old school before, and they're going to be like, well, what do we do? Just like when we were kids, and we picked up these ADD books, and we're like, well, what do we do now? And, and then you had to fight your way through the language, right? And then you right. translate it all. And then yeah. from there, you interpreted what you thought you should do, which was probably wrong. Yeah. So I've, not, I've tried not <laughs> to make language a barrier. And I've tried to speak to different 
groups of people, both the veteran player and the new player. And and so the the previous one was for the older player, which they're probably familiar with already. And then this one's for the new player. What age uh, do you think um, a kid would, in your opinion, have to be in order to pick up Dragon Slayer and run with it? Um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, depends on the kid, you know, um, every kid's different. Everyone's ability to apprehend and comprehend the material is different. And so, uh, really, um, the, I, I can say this, the language is not a barrier. It's not, I, I've not written in high guy Gaxian for a reason. Um, there's a time and a place for academic language. I don't think this is the place for it. So, uh, I don't know. I, 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 if a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old would have no problem. Yeah. I don't think be able to do it. Should yeah. be able to do it. And, and what all I'm doing really is basing it on my experience at that time. And I know the slog that I had trying to translate Gygaxian language yeah. and I, that's gone from this. So yeah, yeah. I, I think that's probably okay. Well, I, th I think a 10 year old kid would fare a lot better with a uh, dragon slayer than, you know, reading Gygax for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. know, to this day, I go to those manuals, and it's, I don't know if it's the way it's laid out or, you know, just how how wordy it is. It just seems to me like almost unusable as, as like a, a, you know, how-to book for, for the game. But I'm Well, it's also, it. you know, I don't want to, um, I don't want to downplay it. Like, there was growth to sit down with a book in words you didn't know or recognize and have to sit there with a dictionary to figure out what the heck they were. And that built your literacy. And, and it did for me, uh, I sure. can say. So, you know, I think that there's, there is some um, benefit in growth, bumping into things that it takes you two or three times to read. You're not gonna understand everything the first time you, you read a thing, and even as adults. Yeah. so. Uh, you know, and I encourage my uh, my students to say, you know, just because you read something once doesn't mean you understand it. You need to the nuances of what's in the text um, only come out on a second or a third read. So, you know, th those are important things to consider. But, you know, it's a, it was a different time then. Um, literacy was was probably a little further along than it is now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so here yeah. we are. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I actually I have a. Um someone I know go to church with and he, he, he teaches um, literature at the college level. And I've asked him like, uh, so have you noticed like a measurable decline in over the years that you've been teaching? And he was sad to report that he has. And he told me a few anecdotes about that as well. Yeah, I would agree. Sonny, what, you were going to say something, buddy. What was it? Yeah. We all like, love Gary Gygax here, but I gotta say, reading his work is like trying to read classic Shakespearean. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not gonna happen too easy. No. But uh, like, you're right. You're absolutely right. But there's uh, there's growth in doing it. And let's face it, you know, if you move far along in your education, you are gonna bump into things where you read it and you're like, oh my goodness, what the heck is this person trying to say? And, and then you you start looking at the metaphors that are used and you start looking at the other devices that are used and then you're ah now i get it and then a world a literary world opens up for you when you're exposed to writers like that and and so as an educator i definitely feel that way i just chose not if you read any of my academic stuff it's going to have tons of, of five dollar words but but this is not the time or the place yeah no that's yeah yeah no Sonny's a smart kid. He, um, when he was like 12 or 13, he picked, uh, Ludwig von Mises's, uh, socialism off of my, my, my bookshelf, mm -hmm. which is uh, a very involved critique of socialism, uh, written in the twenties. And, um, and he read that thing. He took it to school and read it. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So, when he's interested in something, he'll focus right in on it. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's, I, that's the way. Yeah. So I now know exactly how the like Radiant that, Citadel but... will not work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, it's, it's smart kids like that that will latch on to this type of thing, you know, because there's 
um, even even with how clear this is, like there are certainly there's a lot involved with a role playing game of this caliber, you know. So, um, but you're trying to take it, you're just trying to be methodical and take it step by step, and and then you, you know, and you don't want it to be a set of handcuffs either. Like the role role playing games are not supposed to be handcuffs; they're supposed to be guidelines. And there are times when you can color outside the lines. Uh, because it's a creative, it's creative expression. So, and there's opportunity to do that within this model. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Well, um, Greg, I, I don't want to keep you too late. I know that you uh, want to be spending time with your family and such, but I just want to let you know that um, we're so uh, tickled to have had you on and to, you know, uh, interacted with you in this way that you spent your time with us. We sure appreciate it. And um, I, I want people out there to know how excited we are about Dragon Slayer and what a great product it is. I, I do highly recommend it. I endorse it for everybody. Uh, if you're, you know, at all interested in um, D and D, you need to check this out uh, because it's going to be worth your while. But thank you so much, Greg, for coming and, and chatting with us. Oh, it's my, the pleasure was mine. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, hey, we get to take part of our Sunday afternoon and, uh, and talk about one of our passions together. And that's what it's all about. All right. Great. Well, you have a good one. And maybe we'll talk again. But, um, yeah, sure appreciate it, Greg. Take care. I, I'd, I'd love that. Anytime. All right. Awesome. Take care, everybody.